Okay, good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you to our teacher's workshop for Kids and Culture Camp 2014. We have our first speaker. His name is Mr. Omar Eaton Martinez, and he's going to present on Pondering Puerto Rico's Paradise. I'm just going to read um, some highlights from his bio. Omar recruits and manages 200 plus interns and fellows who support a wide range of museum projects. He promotes intern fellowship programs to colleges and universities and other institutions. Omar serves as the, as the muse museum liaison and pre and postdoctoral fellows as well as other academic appointments. Gotta get my speech right. I'm gonna skip down. Um, he's gonna tell us a lot about himself and why we actually selected him to present on Puerto Rico, and we're very honored that he is the spouse of one of our founding members, Jamia Eaton. Omar? Thank you. So is it okay if I'm right here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for having me. I am your resident Puerto Rican for the day. <laughs> um, my family uh, came to the uh, United States, the mainland of the United States, back in 1966. Uh, they immigrated from Puerto Rico then. My father was recruited by NASA uh, to become an engineer, and he worked there for 40 years. And as a result, he uh, then asked my mother to marry him, and uh, she came in six days after they were married. And we've been here ever since. And so that's how we got here. And as a child, what they did with me basically as soon as I was in school age, as soon as the school ended, I was on the plane to Puerto Rico, and I did not come back until it was time for school to start. So I always um, appreciated that because it gave me an opportunity to know my family, but also just as important to know my culture and to get to know some context of my history. Um, certainly every last summer trip was not a history lesson, but when I was prepared to dig deeper, I had context, and that allowed me to really grow as an individual and ultimately as a scholar. So. I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Uh, this is the title, Pondering Puerto Rico's Paradise. What again is basically the indigenous term of Puerto Rico. So the Tainos that were there uh, did have a name for the island before the Europeans came to, uh, to basically take it over. And uh, this is what they call themselves. And as a result, it sort of resonated through generation upon generation that uh, you know, we know that Boricua is a term that you may hear a lot of Puerto Ricans use, especially in the mainland in New York, you hear that a lot. And so people have adopted over generation over generation, but it originally came from the Tainos. And we also should know that basically uh, Puerto Rico is, and it is met as are in many other Latino countries, but Puerto Rico really focuses on the fact that there's that Raices, three races, uh, you know, the, uh, the African, the Taino, which is the indigenous, and of course the, the, the Spanish conquistadors and the people that came in to uh, originally take over. So, this is a map of Puerto Rico. Uh, my family is from the San Juan metropolitan area. Um, that's where the, the biggest airport is. Uh, that's where most of the traffic that comes to Puerto Rico comes through this area right here. And then, so San Juan sort of serves as the north port for Puerto Rico. Then you have uh, over here, which is Fajardo. Fajardo serves as the east port. And then over here, Mayaguez serves as the west port. And then Ponce serves as the main south port for the uh, island. And as you see, then the island, what you're going to learn a little bit about today is the biodiversity of the island. It's it's, there's a lot going on in Puerto Rico, not just culturally, but also in terms of geographics and the landscape. And so just a, a, a quick one, so we'll get we'll dig deeper a little bit, but you have the rainforest at Junque, you have the mountains in the middle from Calle all the way to Marigal, mm -hmm. and then you have um, places like Guanica with the dry forests and Salinas, and then you have these bioluminescent bays, which there are only five bioluminescent bays in the whole world and three of them in Puerto Rico. Um, and of course you have on the west coast, the Nicone and Mayaguez, where there's a lot of, um, it's, it's a high tide, so a lot of surfers go over there. 
And so it's, just a, it's a really, it's just a, it's an interesting place to kind of explore in terms of geography and, and, and just a, a diverse demographic. And then we have also, I should say, the two, there's actually several islands that make up Puerto Rico. This is the main island. Then you have two more known smaller islands, Vieques and Culebra, which are inhabited. And then you have other smaller islands that are not inhabited, including over here, which is the bay in Colcataño, where there are some small islands you can actually see from Old San Juan. And um, so there's a bunch of little islands that make up Puerto Rico. My mother's family is actually from Vieques, so they came from Vieques and, and they migrated to the mainland um, when my, grand, my maternal grandfather came and married my maternal grandmother and moved the family to San Juan and Carolina. So, just some, you know, just some quick pointers. It's not really difficult to kind of go through a, a history of a country um, in a few slides, but just to point out some main things, you know, the Dainos were the original, the indigenous people there. Um, historians and anthropologists have recognized that they've had a full culture as early as 1000 AD. Uh, they call it the island board again, which we already talked about, which means the great land of the valiant lord. And so it has a specific, significant meaning to the culture, and it's sort of empowering when you understand the context of what Puerto Rico is and what it's gone through over the last 500 years. Um, then, of course, in 1493, Columbus came, and that's when the Spanish influence started to come in. Um, there was a lot of you know, horrible wars, and just like it happened in most of the mid-Atlantic slave trade, mm -hmm. uh, the Europeans came in, did a, a really, really horrible job in wiping out the indigenous people, um, but a lot of the culture and some of the people still maintain, just like they did here in, in the mainland United States. Um, but then, as a result, uh, the Europeans did the same thing they did everywhere. They started bringing in Africans and enslaving them. Uh, you know, it starts off with indentured servitude, but it ultimately becomes race-based slavery as early as 1517, which actually predates what United States usually, um, when the United States usually talks about bringing the first Africans over. So, Maybe, maybe 10 year difference, not a whole lot of difference, but if, if we understand that the context of the Midland slave trade is that most of the, the Africans that were enslaved were brought over here were brought over to the Caribbean. Only a small fraction were actually brought here to the United States. And, and a lot of times what they would do is they would bring in the um, enslaved Africans to the Caribbean and, and kind of try to bring them back to the health after emaciating them through this passage. And then they would try to then, if they didn't remain in those islands, then they would take them to the United States to try to try to sell them after they tried to make them healthy again, usually unsuccessfully. So then, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of hundred years. In 1789, they had the Real Cedula de Su which is basically a royal decree from um, the Majesty, which gave restrictions on freedom status. So then you had people who were um, there were certain rules in terms of blacks gaining their freedom. They did have an opportunity to buy their freedom and work outside of a certain time frame. So whenever they were doing for the, for the people that owned them, they were given a certain amount of time to work on their own and, and save money. But there were so many restrictions to it, it didn't really help very much. So it didn't really increase the opportunity as you know it may have looked on paper because there were just so many restrictions. And then a few years later, uh, because what people don't realize, and uh, one of the uh, scholars, Jose Luis Gonzalez, wrote a book called the Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, the Four-Story Country, and he talks about um, Africans and, and, the, and the mestizos, the Dainos, being the first story of Puerto Rico, because if you think about who Puerto Ricans are in terms of the media today, and what it was originally, the mo most of the Puerto Rico, original Puerto Ricans were really people of color. They were black, they were Daino, they were not white. Um, and so when I, I bring up that point because in Cedula de Gracias, what they did was they had put another royal decree because they saw that in Puerto Rico there were more blacks than whites and they were very present about the situation that was happening in the rest of the West, uh, the West Indies. There were a lot of slave revolts, people were taken over, they were taking note of what happened in Haiti with Toussaint Louverture, and so then they got scared. And so they issued this decree. And what they did was they empowered poor white Spanish, Spanish uh, people to come from Spain to Puerto Rico and, Gu and, and Cuba so that they can start over their lives with a higher status. Mm -hmm. And this was an attempt to widen the, the population and, and, 
And that's why, you know, you might see in Puerto Rico um, maybe less people of darker hue, but certainly there were, at one point there were more Africans there, than, just like in most of the English Caribbean and in places like the Dominican Republic and, and Cuba. So in 1873, slavery was abolished, so it was 10 years after the United States. And then, of course, um, 1898, we had the Spanish-American War. So one of the things that's really unique about Puerto Rico is that it's been under sovereignty uh, for half a millennia from two different countries. So it has not had independence for over 500 years. Um, there's very few places I know on earth that exist that way. And so it's really telling about the culture and about the people and how it affects the way people look at things, especially with the modern day, um, the modern day uh, you know, dis disputes and debates about Puerto Rican statehood and of course what's going on the island presently with this economy. So um, that was set forth in the Treaty of Paris um, in 1898. Then we had the Jones Act of 1917. Um, this was the act that gave Puerto Ricans U.S. citizenship. So basically for the first almost 20 years of their existence under the influence of the American government, they were not citizens. And in 1917, they were made citizens. Why? Because we were at war. Mm. And so they needed more soldiers. And of course, uh, they were uh, eager to give Puerto Ricans the opportunity to become citizens. Um, and we know that in the course of history with most uh, people of color, I don't care what demographic you're part of, usually the idea is you can gain a higher status within your country through military service. So, you know, it was, it's sort of one of these things where it's, a, it's sort of definitely, uh, you know, the, the person in power taking advantage of the person not in power, but it's supposed to be mutually exclusive, but, you know, it depends on who you ask and where you stand on the issue. So, um, of course, the Puerto Ricans of African descent, just like the African Americans here in the United States, um, went through a lot of discrimination in the military as well. So it was no different in Puerto Rico than it was in the mainland United States. All right, now we're going to get into some landmarks. San Juan National Historic Site. It's an interesting place because I grew up coming to El Morro, and I uh, would go out there with my family. And if you walk into El Morro, it's on the edge of Old San Juan. There's a beautiful field, it's nice and open, it's very green. We would always go out there to picnic, but I had no idea that this was something that was under the National Park Service and Department of Interior's care. I just knew it was this old fort that was sitting there because probably the 20 times that I went as a child, we probably went inside once or twice. So um, it's interesting to find out later on when I did work for the National Park Service that this was the National Park Service. So because of its geographic position at the western edge of the Caribbean, uh, it made San Juan one of the key frontier outposts of Spain's West Indies. Um, San Juan National Historic Site includes Castillo San Cristobal, Castillo San Felipe del Moro, Fortín San Juan de la Cruz, known uh, locally as El Cañuelo, and three-fourths of the city walls. So it sort of borders the outskirts of old San Juan. You can actually walk along those borders. And then ultimately goes into another landmark we're, we're going to look at called uh, La Fortaleza, which was built by, um, they were both built by the, the, the Spanish people that came over there um, in the early, early, earlier part of the history. And La Fortaleza now is used as the governor's mansion. I had the um, opportunity to go inside there um, for a meeting in a different capacity. It's a beautiful place, very well maintained, um, but they maintained sort of the historical facade and some of the historical rooms with some of the historical artifacts, but then they caught it sort of modernized as well so that it could be livable for whoever's holding the governor's seat. And then you have websites on the bottom of this, so I'll make this available for you all so you can go on. There's a lot of great um, kids activities on the National Park Service website that has to do with the San Juan National Historic Site. And yes, that is us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So La Fortaleza is the current official residence of the governor. Um, it was built between 1533 and 1540. Again, it's, uh, it's a beautiful building, very well maintained. Um, it goes under the, uh, uh, the historic, uh, uh, what's it called, Section 106 Historic Compliance. So it's all very well maintained. And then if you go on the outskirts of it, like right here, there's a wall. And actually right here is sort of, a, maybe not this part, maybe more towards here, there's like a boardwalk. And usually it's artisans and craft makers now. They can go down there and buy crafts and different things that, uh, that the artists make for sale. 
So it's a great area in Old San Juan. It's very touristy for those who have not been. Then we have this landmark, um, Observatorio de Arecibo, the Arecibo Observatory. This is actually something that was uh, created uh, with the National Science Foundation. It's, uh, one of, it's the largest observatory of its kind. It sits in Arecibo, which is in the northern part, sort of in the central northern coast of Puerto Rico. And um, it's a famous place. Like I think they filmed like some James Bond movie mm -hmm. there. And it's really big and massive. It sits on a very high point in Puerto Rico. And um, it, you know, there's a lot of science being done there. And, and what people don't always appreciate about the island is how much it is involved with scientific discovery in different capacities. This is another uh, picture of it. So that's the observatory. It's a radio telescope um, right there in the municipality of Arecibo. Uh, again, it's operated by SRI, SRI International, USRA, and the UMET. UMET is the University of Metropolitan, which is um, one of the major universities in Puerto Rico. So it's, they have a relationship not only with uh, National Science Foundation, but also with the, the university to kind of put forth uh, you know, cutting edge research. So we're going to talk about geography. Again, this is the uh, this is the, the map that we're going to use to kind of get some um, context. Again, you see the islands in the middle. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, Puerto Rico is just one big mountain, and then what you see above sea level is the island. And so the peaks naturally come in the middle. And, um, and then you're going to see uh, all the different uh, landmarks we're going to talk about in a few minutes. So the geography is 110 miles um, east to west and about 40 miles north to south. Uh, the climate, the average uh, temperature is 82 degrees. It does not differ very much from winter to summer. I think the average um, averages differ maybe less than 10 degrees. Uh, so it's pretty warm most of the time. It has had cold fronts there. I mean, there was a time, I remember a couple years ago, I was getting a lot of Facebook messages from my cousins saying how cold it was because it was 70 degrees. And that type of thing. But, so it happens, it happens. And of course, if you go into the mountains, where it's higher elevation, then it'll get colder. You do need a jacket for those areas. It's beautiful up there, but uh, it can get a little chilly sometimes. So there's 3.66 million residents on the island. What I don't really get into a lot in terms of the slides is the diaspora of what is Puerto Rican. You know, Puerto Ricans come uh, and they, they land everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in New York, um, some in D.C., not really much right now, but mostly in New York, Chicago, um, Orlando now is a big hub for Puerto Ricans. Um, also, uh, Milwaukee actually has a few Puerto Ricans, so there's a lot of people moving around. And if you look at what we call uh, American Latinos now, certainly the Mexican American is the largest out of out of that out of those divisions. But um, Puerto Rico is the second largest. But it's like night and day because I think Mexican Americans make up 64 percent of what it is to be Hispanic mm -hmm. in the United States, whereas Puerto Ricans are nine percent, so it goes from one to two. That's the variance. But there's a lot of Puerto Ricans on in the mainland. I think there's probably as many or more Puerto Ricans at this point in the mainland in the United States and other places outside of Puerto Rico. You said nine percent. Yeah, nine percent of like all Latinos. If you, if you break it down for like Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, Cubans, so on and so forth, mm -hmm. out of that group, they make, Puerto Ricans make up nine percent of the Latino population. Oh, Latino. Mm -hmm. Wow. Now, what's always gets skewed though is I, sometimes those numbers, I, I don't know if they always include the Puerto Ricans on the island. And that's always been the question in the debate. Are they including those people as well? Or are they just including the, probably the four million that are here? So you know, it, it will skew the numbers a little bit. There's Yunque, one of my favorite places, the rainforest. It's gorgeous, beautiful, rich, green, luscious, biodiversity um, in terms of not just the plants, but also the animals are there. It's a popular hub for bird watching, um, all kinds of different birds, a lot of them that are only um, endemic to that area, so you, they can't be anywhere else, you can't find them anywhere else. Um, and we got to go and visit that. Usually it's funny because as a, as a child growing up, I would go to Junque because my, my great uncle had a house in Junque, um, technically, um, and, uh, but I never actually went to the park because there's a park that is managed not by the Park Service, by the Forest Service, on the USDA. And so I went for the first time 
with Jimmy and the kids with uh, Juan and Sanai, and it was, you know, interesting. They had some interesting things in there. This is actually the entrance to that, and you can't see this because we got so dark from all the, all the sunlight. <laughs> that's Sanai trying to smile, that's Juan, and that's me. So that's us right there in the front. So again, in Junke, it's a 28,000 acre size um, forest, which is actually small for the Forest Service. But because of the immense biodiversity, they, they consider this place a high priority. Um, it is in Luquillo Mountain. Luquillo is a wonderful place. It has, it's near, it's sort of near the beach. It's, it's like maybe a, a five mile, no, not even five miles, maybe like a quarter of a mile from the beach. And Luquillo is famous beach because it's actually very shallow. Out for uh, miles, it's popular for the for families to take their children, especially their young children, who don't know how to swim because they can go out there and, and kind of participate without having too many worries and concerns. Um, but the, the rainforest is in Lukino Mountains, and it's, it's a great, great place to go visit. And this again is the website we have, so there's some learning activities on there for you to use um, and, um, for the camp. Then we have Bosque Seco de Guanica. So we have a rainforest on one side of the island and a dry forest on the other. It's a really interesting place because you think dry forest, you may think desert, you may think cactus, because that's what we're used to. Those are the images that have been given us growing up here in the mainland of the United States about what something like that might look like or sound like. But it's really green. It's really green over there. But it has very different uh, you know, plants and trees, things that you've never seen, seen before. So it's an interesting place to go visit. And this is managed by the Department of Natural Resources under the Puerto Rican government. Um, so you can go on here, it's also registered as the United Nations International Biosphere Reserve because of all the uh, unique types of animals and plants that are there that you can't find anywhere else. And again, uh, if you go onto this website, it'll give you some more information. You may be able to build that activity around the information you find on that website. Then we have the bioluminescent mm -hmm. bay. Now this is pretty amazing. I mean, this looks but this is absolutely real. This is a water you're looking at. It's the body of water you're looking at. And what happens is you have these organisms, you know, these, the, the, this pyrodinium bahaminids. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. But um, what happens is when you engage those waters and you make those things move, they light up. So it's, it's like, you know, have a firefly. It's kind of amazing, you know, you see those fireflies and they light up. It's the same idea, probably it's a different process, obviously, but I had the opportunity of actually swimming in that, yes. which you're not totally not supposed to do, by the way, so don't go do that. But we were able to do it um, when I was working with NASA because if one of the bioluminescent bays is managed by University of Puerto Rico, Mayak West, we had a special relationship with them. So we took us out on the boat at night, we got to jump in, and as soon as you jump in, like it lights up, and yeah. you can wait, you can go way like this. If someone's and looking at you, it's like you're in glow, like yeah. you're glowing. It's, what? Because yeah. it looks like something in a movie. It's, it's, Seriously. Yeah, it's very it's it's like pretty supernatural. Hard. I boxed them up and thought it was going to be in magic water. Yeah, it, it, is, like it, it is absolutely amazing. So you have those two bays, um, one on the southwest, off the southwest coast, and one that's more popular on the east coast is called Mosquito Bay. Um, so here's the, here are the three bays. This is the one that I was at, and this is the one that's really popular, and this is the one that's off Vieques. So yeah, Bajaldo Vieques and Lajas. Yeah. This is the one I was at. So it was, yeah, you go there and it's just amazing. But now if you go to Bajaldo, Mosquito Bay, which is the more popular one, um, what they do is they don't let people jump in, obviously, but um, what they do is they have, they can let you kayak out there, which I think is a good alternative because with you know when you're oaring you can see them line up because you're moving it. But before what they were doing was they were just having people be in a glass box boat, which can be good. But it just depends how much movement you get, and it has to be dark. So it's actually better if it's cloudy and dark, you know. So which you know it's usually no problem in Puerto Rico because it rains every day. Right? So you have that, and of course this is a website you can go to and get some more information about PuertoRico.com. Then we have Parque de las Cavernas de Camoy. It's a beautiful uh, caverns. If you've been to Larray Caverns, it's very similar. Um, got to walk through there also. You see the stalagmites and all those type of things. Uh, so again, the biodiversity in Puerto Rico is vast, it's amazing, it's, it's very robust. So these caverns were part of a larger network of natural limestone caves, underground waterways. 
Uh, I believe there's a lot of history of the Dainos using this to get back and forth and strategically in terms of times of war as well. And the case system was discovered in 1958 and first documented in 73. So again, um, you have this information to kind of look at to, uh, to build activities off of this information. Now, the, uh, we have the patron saint festivals, or the Fiesta Patronales. These are famous in Puerto Rico. Each city or town uh -huh. has a patron saint. And this is based on the influence of, of Catholicism, but also mixing it in with Yoruba culture from Africa and indigenous Taino culture as well. So this is where you get that mix, that interaction from all three cultures mixed together fairly evenly. If you ask more, most anthropologists and people who write about this stuff, it's a fairly even scope. I think it started off probably heavier Spanish, but I think over the years, the African influence and the Dino influence kept on kicking in, and they would make adjustments to what they, how they would celebrate this. But this is very um, similar to like the, 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 the carnivals, if you know, from the other countries. Yeah, question? I'm sorry. Uh, just a quick question. Um, you were saying the indigenous culture still remained, even though they wiped out so many of the indigenous people? Right. How how, that's a great question. I don't know how, I don't know if there was a movement. For these type of things I find when I study culture, some things are just dominant. And, and you can't get rid of it because of the space that you're in. Because once you enter that space, you have to start making certain compromises. And you have to start, because a lot of the existing culture that makes Taino what it, what it is to be Taino is because they were in that space. So as people who come from Spain and they come in that space, they have to start making certain adjustments. For instance, there are certain things that the Spanish never encountered in Spain that they encountered there. There was only one name for it that they know. So these types of words that come from Taino culture um, were automatically adopted in Spain because there was no word for it in Spanish. And so just because you're in that space, you kind of have to assimilate even though you're the dominant person in terms of politics and warfare. So that's, I think that's how a lot of it comes in. And they do have cultural centers? There are cultural the, centers now. For the indigenous population? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. I experienced that um, in my work with, with NASA. We had we should do uh, science, uh, a teacher science workshop. And we went to Maya West, and Maya West, there's a cultural center maybe an hour from there. And they came in, and technically, according to them, I'm, I'm, I'm officially dying. Like, they put me like through this like rite of passage type thing, and, and it was good. I mean, so yeah, certainly there are people who still practice the culture, just like even here in D.C., where people don't think they're Native Americans, that's because they don't look like the Native American that we grew up with in the cowboy movies, because there's been so much uh, mixing. Uh -huh. uh, but they're here, and they're practicing the culture, and they're, and, and they're teaching it to the next generation. It's the same thing's happening in Puerto Rico. So it's not like a full-scale thing, but it's certainly happening. And what percentage you say uh, are Purely Taino and online. I, I don't know. I would I would think it's very small yeah. in terms of pure, um, but I, I I don't have that information. Do they do reservations like they do? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think they're recognized by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. That's a great question though because technically they should be. They should be because but but people struggle with that all the time because that 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 type of recognition is based by this very antiquated blood law, mm -hmm. which is why you know the Piscataway Nation here. Mm -hmm just got recognized two years ago by the state. It's still not recognized that Because uh, the, it's, I believe, I don't know what the percentage is, I want to say it's 8% or something like that, but something very small. But what happened is there's a lot of politicizing and discrimination behind it because a lot of the skyways are phenotypically African looking, they're black. Mm -hmm. and, and, but if you go to some other nations, a lot of them are phenotypically white, but they don't have it. Getting, getting, getting recognized. So this is sort of the struggle that's been happening. And of course, there's other extenuating circumstances as well. But they did make one giant step two years ago in getting recognized by the state. But they're still working on getting recognized by the United States government. And of course, because all of the reparations that will come with that, you know, they're just not going to get that to anyone. That's just how it is. Great question, though. My favorite one is in Louisa. Uh, Louisa is. Uh, where it's one of the places in um, Puerto Rico that was known when the, when the Africans were, were, were freed. Um, they went to that area to settle down. But of course, they were throughout areas surrounding Luisa, which is really sort of technically part of the, um, the larger San Juan metropolitan area. It's not too far from San Juan and San Dulce, maybe like a half an hour. You have areas like Canovanas, which is right next door. It also has a lot of people um, 
African descent, as well as Catalina. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, and then they're dispersed. I mean, I've met a lot of, um, you know, Afro Puerto Ricans from Ponce and, and places like that. So, you know, they, they're definitely scattered at this point in, in history. It's not just in one place. So, Marisa, and Jamea got to go and she got to experience that. You got to see the boom by Atlanta. And hopefully, I will show you that video yeah. before we go. One of my cousins is on that video. So, so notable people. This was very hard. For me to do notable people because as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so Dr. Jose Celso Barbosa, he was a physician, sociologist, political leader of Puerto Rico, known as um, the, the, I think he started the Puerto Rican uh, New Progressive Party, the father of statehood, so he was one of the ones early, early on talking about statehood in Puerto Rico. Um, he was born in 1857 in Bayamón, he died um, in San Juan in 1921. Uh, so obviously this is an African uh, a man of African descent. Um, again, and this is the type of things that I, I hope that we can share. I know this is the focus of kids and culture to make sure that we're telling the whole narrative of what's happening here. Uh, because obviously in the media today, you do not see these type of people, but they exist and they're there. Okay. Uh, Theodore Schomburg, a bibliophile writer. He is famous for basically creating this collection of writings that uphold and put forth on a high pedestal the African contribution to the world. You know, so he's a Pan-Africanist, mm -hmm. but he was born in Puerto Rico. He spent most of his adult life in New York. And so over the course of his life, he collected all these writings, and it was based on an interaction he had with his teacher, who told him that Africans have no history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess he got mad. And so he was like, well, I'm gonna prove you wrong, and he started a collection, and as a result of that collection, um, it grew and grew and grew, and it gained so much value that the New York Public Library saw fit to buy it from Mr. Schomburg, and then hire him on to oversee it. And so now, many years later, we have the Schomburg Research in the Black Culture and Home. And so he uh, was born in Santos in 1874, and died in Brooklyn in 1934. Pedro Aviso Campos. The best way to describe him for people who are really into African American history is he's sort of like the Puerto Rican version of Malcolm X. Right. Okay, he's an independent, <laughs> he was the father of the independence movement. Um, but certain things are different. First of all, he predates Malcolm X, number one. Uh, and number two, uh, he actually has a degree from Harvard, a law degree from Harvard, which he earned with contention because they, he was going to be the valedictorian. But they stripped him from that because they didn't want anybody of color being the valedictorian of that law school. Wow. Harvard Law School. And so he had to fight and contend. He, 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 he got it he got it awarded, you know, retroactively, like it was afterwards. So he never got to give his valedictorian speech. And he's a famous or he's famous for his oratorical skills. Um, one of his famous speeches is called El Grito de Lares, which is a speech he gave about in Puerto Rican independence. And if you hear him speak, even if you don't understand Spanish, you can just hear the tonality and, and the intention he had in every last word and syllable. Great, great, great speaker. And so, yeah, Pedro Aviso Campos. Um, we've been working at Smithsonian with a young man named Michael Torres, who was actually doing a documentary on him, and hopefully it'll be out soon, called Who is Aviso? And actually, you can probably see clips of it on YouTube now if you want to go look it up. Then we have Ruth Fernandez. Uh, she was the very first successful Afro-Puerto Rican female singer. Uh, she wrote color barriers and stereotypes similar to the story of Mary, of Mary Anderson. Okay, and, um, but one of the things she did was, as a result of her success, she actually went into the political arena and she became a senator within the Puerto Rican government uh, for nine years. And um, she died just recently in 2012. So you have this image representing Puerto Ricans and you can imagine what type of contention that cause, that can cause. Um, I think, though, if you look back in history, there's actually some parts of history that are actually more accepting of that then than it is now. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting about that. Because, um, of course, you have her contemporary in Celia Cruz and from Cuba. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of her success was stateside, you know. So it's interesting how that happens. You said stateside? Yeah, so she could, you know, uh, Celia Cruz lived in New York for a long time, lived in New York and Florida. So just, you know, from Cuba to, to when she came over. So, you know, it's just interesting how people have to go, just like a lot of black, black artists had to go to Europe right. to kind of really get the recognition that they deserve because 
of the sort of, you know, of the racism that was happening here. Good question. Would you say, so during that time, more musicians were politically charged, whereas now in Puerto Rico, maybe not as much politically charged? No, no, I wouldn't say. It just depends on which genre of music. Okay. Uh, salsa and merengue actually, uh, one of the things, and I remember some of my cousins used to tell me they didn't like about salsa and merengue, they always talked about politics. I mean, that's not what, you know, teenagers didn't necessarily appreciate that. But uh, so there's certainly a lot of political stuff in, in, in that type, some of the genres of music. And even the reggae do now is people like Daniel Gunn, they don't, they, they talk about some political things too. It's not all complete nonsense. Okay. So, <laughs> some of it's actually meaningful and conscious. Roberto Clemente, my hero. Baseball player, first Latin American to be inducted in the Hall of Fame. Imagine that. This man with this face was the first Latin American baseball player. Now, people don't always talk about that. In fact, what he is known for a lot also is he was actually part of the only all-black baseball team that won the World Series, the Pittsburgh Pirates, in 1971. That's the only team that was all-black. This so happened to be that they had a, that all the stars were black that year, and they won. And um, so he, he gets to straddle um, the, the beautiful thing of being black and being Latino, especially in the context of the United States, and so when I hear about his story, it always moves me because he always fought for the rights of Latinos and for people to respect him. People he used to have a lot of trouble when they would want to um, interview him because he spoke with a very thick accent and his English wasn't perfect, and they tried to clown him about that. But he always stood his ground and, and set them straight. And as a result, he was he was he was he was basically categorized as somebody who was honorary mm -hmm. and somebody who didn't who wasn't really you know respectful of the media. But it, it wasn't anything about that. It was he wanted to be respected. And, um, but he never let that move him in terms of how he treated people. And as a result, he became a great humanitarian. But also due to his humanitarianism, he died as a result, of died, died a martyr's death uh, going on to Nicaragua. Nicaragua had suffered a mudslide, and he wanted to go there and give them some aid. And instead of just putting money on it, sending them somebody over there, he got on the plane because he wanted to go help. And as a result, when he got on that plane, unfortunately, he crashed and he died. And so he died this martyr's death. So you think it was intentional? No, 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 no I, I definitely not. No conspiracy theory here. Okay. I just think it's unfortunate. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Dr. Marta Morena Vega, uh, very understated scholar. She's done a tremendous amount of work on Afro Latin God, born in East Harlem and in Barrio, Puerto Rican to the core. She started many different. Um, cultural institutions. She was part of the Museo del Barrio. Uh, she started with, uh, she, she's currently the founder and executive director of the Caribbean Cultural Center of the African Diaspora Institute, which I believe now's new offices also reside in East Harlem, where she was born and raised. And she just does a lot of things. One of, the, one of the things that recently brought her to a little bit more prominence was when they did the, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the HBO Blacklist, well, they did a Hispanic version yeah. of that, and she was one of the only like African representations of Latin God in that. And so that kind of brought her to prominence a little bit more for like, this newer generation of people that really don't know about that. Uh, but she's been at this for years. She's not new to this at all. She's been at this for, for a long time. So she's another, another great notable that I wanted to share with you all. So music. Um, I, I will mention this only because my wife's in the room. I know she'll appreciate it. But the top earning model right now is a black Puerto Rican by the name of Joan Small. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> uh, music. So we have Hibero music. Hibero's are sort of the what, what people would call the Puerto Rican hillbillies. Right? They were small farmers. They worked in the rural areas. Hard working. I guess the, now blue collar I think would give them too much status. They're probably uh, under that. Um, and they're traditionally celebrated for, you know, the self-sufficiency, hospitality, love, very into their culture and artistic uh, ways of representing themselves, especially to their music. And, and this our instrument right here is not a guitar, it's a cuatro, which is a Spanish, it's a relative of the guitar family uh, from the Spanish Miuela, and they use that for, to do their folkloric music. Very popular in Chicago right now, for many years it's been a cuatro festival and they celebrate that instrument and the music that, that, that is created by that instrument. Okay, one my Blena. I'm going to pause for a moment and see if I can go back and play the video so that you all can experience a, a couple minutes of what it sounds and looks like.
So Bomai Plena is uh, has heavy, heavy African and Yoruba influences. If you listen to the music, it's call and response. Um, it's very much like if you were listening to Mary Makiba or any of that type of music, uh, maybe even Fela, Kuti. It's just, it's just, it's, it's purely African. It, there's some, you know, there's some Spanish influences, but it's really African. I mean, it's really from it's Europe or from West Africa, and so. What they do is, there's usually a conga drum line, this can be anywhere from two, three, six drummers, and people come sort of like a free, a free dance, and just letting the, 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 the drums move them. And a lot of times when you see the one like Blanettos, so they'll be in all white, because it's related to the Yoruba culture and the Yoruba religion, uh, where all white is, is purity. And so they, you'll see them in all white. And uh, the father of this movement was, the one who kind of brought it up um, and made it really famous uh, more recently was Rafael Cepeda, um, who actually is, their whole family is famous in Puerto Rico for for the music and for other types of music. Um, one of the other members of his family is actually a good friend of ours, William Cepeda, who's a great Afro-Latin jazz. Um, he does Bon Mike Blena also. And uh, he's uh, actually, I think he's just got his honorary doctorate degree from the College of Music School of Berkeley. Which I know is a very famous place. So, Bon Mike Plena, some people refer to this as Puerto Rican folkloric music. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very limiting title because it doesn't really tell you everything, but it's it's definitely there and it's powerful, and hopefully we'll be able to use that somewhat in, uh, in, in the camp. Of course, we have the popular merengue and salsa, which is a genre uh, derived from a mixture of Cuban and Puerto Rican influences. Uh, melding and uh, you know, got really popular in the 50s, 60s, and in the 70s, and then sort of started changing. A lot of it came, a lot of the stuff that's popular now actually was not made popular necessarily in the islands. A lot of those, a lot of those people actually were, were New Yorkian. Um, people like uh, Hector Lavoe and, 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 and Cologne and those type of people. So there, there, there's actually a, um, a documentary right now that uh, talks to that where they talk about the space. In the Bronx, it was a it was a, one of the elementary schools, you know, P.S. I mean, they went whatever, when it was on. and so basically they went in there and they would practice, and then they basically created this form, and then they would have huge famous dances there, and um, and that's and that's one of the parts of the history of how my and salsa got so popular. And now it's a global music and dance dance form, and also my nigga has strong influences from the art as well. Uh, you have, uh, you know, came from, you know, actually the earlier late 80s, mid 80s movement of what they call the reggae espanol. Uh, one of the guys really famous for that was in general, which is actually from Panama. And if you know about yeah. Panama, uh, there's a lot of Jamaican immigrants who came there to for work. And, and so obviously the emphasis from Jamaica influenced Panama and ultimately uh, influenced Puerto Rico and other islands who've taken all their don reggaeton have been start, started, so this genre of it has been known to be Puerto Rican, but it did not start in Puerto Rico. But obviously because of the African aesthetic in Puerto Rico, it was easily adopted and they sort of created it their own. Before they even called it reggaeton, I remember they were calling it something, they were calling it underground, and it sort of just developed over the last 20, 25 years. And then you had these, the, one of the two giants, two of the, two of the, the, of the three giants, probably the other one I would say would be Daddy Yankee, um, the Lomar is actually a cousin of a cousin. Um, so whenever I visit that cousin, and they say, well, Omar is coming, everybody gets excited because they think it's him. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I mean, I, she works at a, at a hotel in, 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 in Condado, and you know, one time I stayed there, and like, oh yeah, my cousin Omar is coming. Everybody got excited, they like roll out the red carpet, they're like, Omar. They're looking at me kind of funny, I was like, well, yeah, that's my name. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. sorry. This for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Tego Calderon, he definitely um, had, is known for more conscious lyrics with the reggaeton, and certainly is very, um, very upfront and very explicit about his Africanness. And so, uh, those are the two artists I wanted to highlight there. Now, art, um, these are different URLs you guys can go to to kind of look at different art activities. The Vejigante mask, the mask that we showed in the other slides uh, from Luisa with the carnival stuff, mm -hmm. those are Vejigante masks. Um, you can, there's different ways you can make those with the kids, they'd be great. And of course, 
the flag, we love Puerto Rico, we love our flag, La Bandera, Que Bonita Bandera. And, I mean, we are really obsessive with this flag. It's kind of scary. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, we has at least one piece of clothing. Some, <laughs> at least one piece. At least one. Piece. one uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> so you have that, and then more activities uh, by different aspects of, 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 of Puerto Rico from geography to the animals and different things like that. We'll get into that in a minute. So language. Here's one thing I wanted to share with you all that I thought may be able to implement during the week that you are honoring this culture is um, a greeting. So when uh, a youth or a minor in whatever context may be, because it could be an adult to an older adult, um, you greet that older person saying bendición. And when you say bendición, then the older person responds, que Dios te bendiga. And so bendición is basically a way of the younger person asking the older person for their, for their blessings within the greeting. Mm -hmm. Okay? And then the older person responds, es que Dios te bendiga, I mean, God bless you. So the, the greeting is basically, you know, we, you know bless me, and, and then the person responds, may God bless you. And so that's basically what that means. So I thought that might be an interesting thing to incorporate for the that week. And then another, you know, it's not a greeting, but another designation is, I know, um, I know we use the, 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 the very popular um, Africanism of, of Baba. I know in, in, in Puerto Rico they use Don or Donia, Donia for women, Don for 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 men, and you know certainly you know usually those are for the elders of, commun of the community, or people who are influential or in some cases affluential um, in the community where you call that person Don, whatever their first name is, or maybe even their last name, depending on how you know, what your relationship is with that person. So that's another one. Now, Weba is an expression of joy and congratulations um, and celebratory. So that's something that you may be, be able to incorporate in a way that like when a student does something good uh, or maybe they've just done a performance or a presentation, you know, you can maybe institute that as a, a call and response type of thing when you say Weba just to kind of acknowledge that person for how excited you are for their success. So that's another thing. Sports and games, you have baseball, boxing, and basketball. Didn't really get into that too much because it's pretty regular. It's, you know, it, there's, no, there's no like indigenous games that I know of in Puerto Rico that would matter right now that you know would be able to easily incorporate it. So just sharing that with you. Baseball is huge in Puerto Rico, boxing is huge in Puerto Rico, and, and basketball is starting to become very popular the last 30, 40 years. And Koki. Now this is an animal, a very small frog. Maybe this big, but it's a part of a larger species that exists in other places. What was different about this part is that these, these ones are in Puerto Rico, they make the sound cookie. So it's almost like a cricket sound, mm -hmm. and it's at night. Mm -hmm. And they're so small you can't see them, but it's like a chorus. Wow. And it, it almost, in some places, almost definitely. Yeah, it's, really, it's, it can be really loud. Where you go. It yeah, it can be very, very loud. Mm -hmm. And you know, for the first time, in all the times I've been in Puerto Rico, I saw one live. Never, <laughs> never have I seen one live. But but I was with a, a contingency and um, a group of people, and, and they kept on hearing it. They were like, "Wow, I kind of find it." And there were certain, I never really anybody really cared so much to look at it. But I said, "Okay, well, I'll go with you." I mean, I've never seen one before. I, in fact, I was telling them, "You're never going to find it." I was being like, you know, the hater. And so you never gonna find it. And so then the guy like we got him close, and I think he took it. It was at night. He took the his camera, and he took a picture of the general area he thought, and in the picture it came out. He saw the frog there. Very 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 small, but um, it's one of those things that I mean, if you try to take this type of frog, this type of Eulothorodactylus genus, and put it on another island, it will not survive. So it's one of those things that you know Puerto Ricans have always grasped from the Daino culture all the way through now, always honored this coquia as something uh, very symbolic of Puerto Ricans. So then, oh, this, but that's supposed to be like Tija, that's a lizard that's found in Puerto Rico. Uh, one of the things that freaked my wife out when we went first went there, because they're everywhere, and sort of like the squirrels are here, they're there, they're all over the place, usually pretty small. Um, but they this everywhere. Not when I was a kid, I used to throw rocks at them. It was fun. That's what we did. And, uh, and they're also supposed to be just in Puerto Rico. 
Then we're going to get into um, food. <clears throat> Mofongo is one of my favorite dishes. It's fried plantain mixed in with bacon bits. Mm -hmm. And when you conform it into like this mold, and then you stuff it with whatever your heart is on. Mm -hmm. You can put shrimp, you can put chicken, you can put steak, you can put vegetables. Um, it's fantastic. Um, it tastes very, very good. And it certainly has a heavy, heavy Yoruba influence um, in terms of the way it's cooked. And so um, I put this recipe on the bottom. So when I come to visit you, I fully expect to see a man That's why I was my motivation. Um, and so there you have my phone. Pastelis, um, also very popular, not just in Puerto Rico, but a lot of the Caribbean and Southern Caribbean. Um, we have um, your leaves and you put the, the green mass inside of it. And it's also something you can kind of put garbanzo beans, you can put different types of meat and things like that, and it's pretty, pretty good. This goes into the clothes. Again, there's no really traditional clothes that are just specific to Puerto Rico, but certainly in Guayabera is very popular um, there, but it's popular in many, many places that, that, that have a lot, like that are very hot, right? I mean, I see that in all of West Indies, where I don't care, Francophone, Hispanophone, Anglophone, all those, all those islands, you people see, you see people wearing guayaberas, all the certain Caribbean, um, and that's funny because I grew up thinking that that was a Puerto Rican thing. And so when I started meeting other people that were wearing them from different cultures and islands and countries, I was surprised. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it certainly it makes sense to me now, but I mean, I was surprised. I, mean, I thought it was so specific to Puerto Rico. I grew up watching my, my, my great uncles and my, my grandfathers wear this, and, um, and I didn't know it existed in other places. But certainly you can go in many places in Africa, people are wearing, wearing this type of shirt, and it's very popular for men to wear. That's the end of my my uh, presentation. Yo soy Boricua, para los demás. And uh, just letting you know, this sort of an affirmation of my Puerto Ricanness. Obviously, when you when you're born in D.C. and you grow up in an area where there's not like a large and geographic and physical Puerto Rican community. And you have my phenotype of, of, of black, and it's, it's can be very difficult, right? You know, you go through a lot of different humps. Um, people kind of deny you, well, how can you be black? How can you be Puerto Rican? And my answer is always like, well, how can you not be? And how come when you say Puerto Rican, it's not implied like it is when you say Jamaican or Virgin Islander? You know, why isn't it? And it's usually because people just don't know. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just sort of a, a testament to, uh, you know, what we see in the media and also a testament to what we see a lack of in the classroom. So um, you guys have a heavy burden. Thank you for taking it on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Any you. questions? I do have a question. Please. Do you find colorism um, in Puerto Rico within like the darker, the, you know, this whole issue with the darker skin and the lighter skin within the yeah. races? Yeah, absolutely you do. Um, you find colorism, and I don't see people using the permanent lighteners like in some other um, parts of the diaspora. But certainly, you know, Jamie and I have had this discussion many times. And I have my daughter cousins who are females who use the makeup to lighten their skin, and it usually doesn't work very well because you know skin that's not meant to be lightened that way. Um, so um, you have that going on quite a bit. Um, but the colorism, I think, it's physical, but it's also very mental and emotional, especially, you know, for women, with the hair and all those types of things and where do they stand. And then what, what I find also, too, is that, you know, when you ask certain people, even in my family, about colorism and racism, they'll deny, a lot of them will deny, especially the older ones. Um, but then you talk about politics and, you know, well, who, who is black who's been governor? No one. Like, that maybe the mayor of Louisa might be black. And I'm saying might be, and Louisa is about as black as you can get in Puerto Rico. And, um, and so, you know, you have these type of things. So what, what about your leadership? You know, what about this political movement? And who's representing who and that type of thing? And that's where it sort of comes in. But at the same time, I think the racial context in terms of racism in Puerto Rico or racism in the United States, you know, I, I hate to make a distinguish 
make a distinction, but there is a distinction. It's a different, because of the history, the history is different. Okay.